Life is so busy. If you blink, you can miss something amazing. It's important to take a moment and enjoy what we have and the people around us. I'm Mo Hagen, Chief Operating Officer for CanFit Pro, and welcome to A Moment with Mo, a podcast where I will welcome some incredible guests to talk fitness and nutrition, mindset and self-empowerment, setting our goals into action, and much, much more. Now let's get chatting. Hello, everyone, and welcome to an extra special episode, A Moment with Mo. And it is super special for many reasons. My guest number one, the topic, for those who know me, is near and dear to my heart, and that is women's leadership. My last episode, we certainly talked about women's leadership and empowerment, but uh, we're going to look at it from a different perspective and set of lenses here today. And I'm super excited that we're going to also explore the powerful theme of International Women's Day campaign for 2024, which is hashtag inspire inclusion. So joining me here today is a remarkable individual, my guest, Dwayne Smith, a seasoned leadership development coach with whom I've had the privilege of collaborating with in the fitness industry for nearly two decades. Dwayne's profound passion for people and fitness coupled with his extensive education and lived experiences, has uniquely equipped him to inspire others to embrace workplaces where everyone's experience is that of a genuine feeling of belonging through inclusive leadership. So without further ado, welcome Dwayne Smith. Wow, thank you so much, Mo, for that introduction. I think I'm still stuck on the adjective remarkable uh, used in front of my name. So uh, I'm going to run with that. I, I, I love the sound of that. Thank you. You deserve it. And um, what I love most about my interactions with you is I always learn every single time you truly are to your accolades. And I'm going to just share a little bit more about your your role and your background. But uh it's so amazing how passionate you are and generous you are in sharing your knowledge. And that's what we're going to dive into today. And I'd love to just ask you questions around not only this year's theme for win- for Women's International, uh, International Women's Day, but also what it means as a leader and for leaders and how we can embrace this, what is a campaign, but really a movement towards where we want to pave a path forward for all leaders. And um, for those who haven't had the distinguished honor of working with Dwayne, let me share with you a little bit more of his formal introduction. As Director of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, Dwayne is a, a people first leader on a mission to provide every associate with the opportunity to grow and thrive. And my friend, you live it and lead it every day. I am witness to that because we do get the opportunity to work together. As a certified public speaker, mastermind group facilitator, and anti-racism certified educator, as well as inclusion inclusion specialist, uh, Dwayne's wealth of experience spans, as I said, over 20 years. And leading diverse teams positions you and Dwayne as a true champion for diversity, equity, and inclusion leadership. So with that, Dwayne, I also want to share a fun fact, is that you live in my hometown of Oakville. (laughs) Uh, You know, Mo, first off, I have to say, again, thank you for the introduction. I'm so humbled and honored uh, to be here with you. And yeah, like I, I can tell you, you know, being in Oakville and managing, um, you know, that club for so many years, like I, I don't think I knew when I was in that area how close I was to you until it got told to me at some point. Um, but I didn't get to see you a lot in Oakville, unfortunately. You're a very, very busy woman building an empire. So uh, I definitely admire you and all the things you've done. I hope there's a, a, a very extensive bio in your podcast description, because as much as you said about me, uh, I think tenfold we could say about what you have done in the fitness industry. And again, I'm so proud and, and honored to be here with you today. So thank you. Oh, well, thank you. 
that's so it's it's uh it's wonder I will I'll just say thank you because that's what we do when we receive compliments is we say thank you and and as a form of self-care just let that soak in so I'm letting that soak in because for someone to share a compliment like that it's um it's to be received with the gift that it was given with so thank you I appreciate mm-hmm. that and thank you for taking time out of your very busy uh, work and journey to be with us today. So for my guests who haven't had the opportunity to hear from Dwayne, let's jump right in. And I'd love this to sort of help this conversation to be that of an unraveling of the significance of inspiring inclusion. And so we're going to explore how understanding and valuing women's inclusion can pave a way for a better world. So on that note, I'd love to start by having you share your definition of inclusion and feel free to comment on also this International Women's Day theme of hashtag inspire inclusion. Yeah, thanks, Mo. Um, When I think of inclusion, I think of inclusion as a perpetual act of feeling or having that sense that of belonging. And this is something that takes ongoing effort um, because it's a verb, you know, for you to make people feel included, it's something that you have to act on all the time. And for people to feel that sense of belonging due to inclusion, it's something that they need to feel all the time. I say it's like any normal relationship between two people. Um, You know, you meet each other in the beginning and there's a lot of chemistry. There's a lot of, you know, fireworks. However, to keep that chemistry and keep those fireworks going, it's a constant act of servitude towards making sure that you are supporting that other person, that you are growing with that other person, and you're helping that other person be the best version of themselves. So when I think about inclusion, I think about it in that same capacity. It's really about connection and and that ongoing pursuit of making people feel that sense of belonging. Um, And, you know, when I think about inspiring uh, inclusion for uh, the theme this year, the first thing I actually think about, you know, obviously, I just talked about my my definition of it and and based on it being a verb and that constant ongoing presence and, and activation of making somebody feel that sense of belonging. I think it starts with demystifying diversity, equity and inclusion. And it's something that, you know, I'm very passionate about. And I see that, you know, the topic of diversity, diversity, equity and inclusion is being spoken about in a very polarized way. So I'm going to say this very clearly. DEI is not polarizing. It's plurific. And it's one of those things that it's so multifaceted. There's so much to it that the prolificness, the prolificness, the nature of DEI, I think in a lot of ways lends itself to be, I think, um, almost put into certain conversations based on the different dimensions in a very polarizing fashion. And I think once we demystify what DEI is, what, what it's about versus what it's not about, I think you'll find that more people will be comfortable in inspiring and inclusion. And I'll give you a, an example. How I just started answering your question in terms of my definition of inclusion, and I related that to partnership and building a relationship, everyone can identify with that because it's either something you want or it's something that you're currently in. So when you think about DEI, think about DEI in that capacity. It's how do I create relationships with people so I can feel good and they can feel good and we could be the best versions of ourselves. I'd like to believe everybody wants to achieve that. And I think as long as we understand the, the definition of diversity, equity and inclusion in the sense that it's plurific, it's not polarizing, then I think people will start to get, you know, come to terms and understanding that I can inspire inclusion. It is multifaceted. But I don't have to be a part of these conversations that are very polarizing because they're not really helping moving the needle in a positive direction. They're just, you know, conversations that I think are taking away from the majority of the people who are having 
really good constructive conversations, which is how do I inspire inclusion? How do I create great partnerships, great relationships, uh, both professional, both personal and both, you know, in business. And I think as long as we start to break down the demystification of DEI and really look at it for what it is, I think people will be more inspired to inspire inclusion. I love that people be more inspired to inspire inclusion. And honestly, we could leave it right there. And it's like the best education in five minutes that I believe I've had when it comes to understand, truly understanding DEI. Thank you for that. And I love how you make it so practical. And that's what makes you a fantastic coach because it's also you meet people where they're at and help people understand. And I've had the privilege of working with you and hearing you speak, but that was just so practical for everyone to understand and embrace. And the, your quote, I wrote it down, DEI is not polarizing, it's prolific. And that is like, that's a mic drop right there, mo moment, <laughs> right there. I'm just going to leave it at that. Thank you. I've <laughs> always wanted a mo moment. <laughs> Oh, that was uh, truly brilliant. Truly brilliant. Um, my my next question, I guess, would be a nice segue is in pursuit then of building a more inclusive world. We say gender inclusive. It could be any type of inclusive world and workplace. And this is the part that I have learned from you is about demystifying the fear around aspects of, of DEI. So we'll talk about the inclusive piece to start with, how do you see fear holding us back from confronting biases and stereotypes? Well, huh, good question. Mm -hmm. Fear is a powerful motivator, isn't it? Mm. Um, you know, when we think about fear, we think about it generally. And, and I, I guess I'll relate it to the, the three aspects of um, fight, flight, or, or freeze. And, you know, when I, if you think about it this way, you know, when you when you talk about bias, when you talk about stereotypes, so stereotypes are an extension of bias. A bias is, is a feeling um, that you have, and stereotypes are usually the articulation of that feeling you have, right? So you have a bias against people who look a certain way, and then the stereotype is saying the description of these people, and however you see them in the world, that's where your automatic thought goes to. And these things, as, as we learn about bias and where biases come from, these things are not only generational, um, so you're a product of your environment. So what are the conversations that are happening around, you know, the Thanksgiving dinner table? Um, you know, what's the what's uncle saying that's inappropriate? Those are things as you're growing up that develop your bias. Um, when you think about what you're inputting through media, that um, uh, creates bias. And you have to remember, too, in media, media is essentially the prolification of bias, because what they essentially do is they're trying to put out entertainment in a way that is easy for people to digest and, re and view. And that means if there's certain characters that are in play, and they need to have a certain, you know, background, like when you think about a gangster, or you think about mafia, you know, you may think of, you know, uh, straight out of Compton for gangster, you may think about, you know, Goodfellas for for mafia, like there's these things that automatically get assigned in our mind, that is so powerful through media. And then you have obviously news and news, you know, propagates a lot of that as well, the way they highlight certain individuals through, um, let's say, arrest photos, or the way they're covering certain incidences based on certain groups more than others. So there's a lot of things. And then you have the intimate bias, your social group, your social setting. And these are the people around you that are your everyday um, influencers. They're your best friends. They're your uh, work colleagues. They're the individuals you spend the most time with. They have a huge impact on how you see the world also, and especially if you have a social group, um, more be it than colleagues, because colleagues you're almost, in a sense, forced to be with based on wherever you're hired and positioned in the company. But in social situations, that's, you know, those are the people you choose to hang out with. And we tend to choose to 
the people who think like us and act like us. So there's not a lot of room for somebody to confront your bias because more or less you're finding people that uh, whether you know it or not, are conform are confirming your biases, right? So there's so many elements that are in play that cause this bias and whatnot. So what happens is when you are faced with these things in real life, things that are outside of your control, like the people you work with per se, or um, you know assignments, projects, or activities that you're involved in, or people that you have to connect with. I think when you are faced with these fears, a lot of the time it falls into those three categories of flight, freeze, or fight. And when I talk about flight, that's the disengagement. That's a person who chooses to disengage from it. And it's it's about that avoidance. It's one of two things. One, I'm going to avoid it because to me, I don't care about it. It doesn't matter. I'm going to think the way I think and that's it. Or it's the... the um, you know, I would say the the naivety, but with Google, I don't think there's much we could be naive about if we don't know something and we could Google it. But it's that uncertainty. It's that I don't really know and, and I don't want to work with it. I don't want to deal with it. So that's that, that flight aspect. The freeze is the avoidance. It's the I'm I believe everybody is the same. I believe that there are no differences. I believe that um, there are no challenges, etc. And then it's it it can actually morph into that whole idea that well, if I do understand these things and I do talk about these things, then I don't want to make a mistake. And because of because of that, I don't want to be shamed. I don't want to be blamed. So therefore, I'm just going to remove myself from the situation and not address it. And then you have fight, and this is somebody who's engaging in it. So that fear now is causing that person to say, you know what? I want to be better. I don't know how to be better yet, that growth mindset. So I'm going to seek out information to understand how I can be better. And I think when we understand those three aspects, we have to understand where are we? Where are we? Are we in the disengagement, which is that flight? Are we in the freeze, which is the avoidance? Or are we in that fight, which is engaging in it and engaging in it in a way to say we need to build, I need to build my cultural competence so I could be better, you know, fitted to really challenge these fears, these biases that are coming up. And I think most importantly, when it comes to biases and stereotypes, it's always great to challenge yourself if you're looking for a way to do it. It is about learning, but it's also about looking for information that contradicts the way you believe. And I think at that point, you could start to uncover different views, different thoughts, different ways of thinking that are going to be outside of the worldview that you've been you've been used to. And I think those are some of the important things to really address if fear is holding you back. Wow. I, I'm, I'm listening and I'm thinking how you related fear from those three aspects and then use that to explain how we how we react, how we act, how we choose to be and how we can also engage with. And I'm thinking to myself, I just wish I had a teacher or professor like you when I was in school or now in my post-secondary, my career, I am privileged. I get to be educated by you, but that that is fascinating how you align that all together. I've never heard it be described as you've described the fear aspects. I always, you know, we all, especially in the fitness industry, relate to the fight flight. We all relate to that, but I love how you relate it to fight flight freeze. And you can, started with that. That's so amazing, Dwayne. And can I tell you why I do that is I, I want to make people understand or hopefully influence them to understand that what we're learning in diversity, equity, and inclusion is not new. There are already concepts in our own lives that we have already been taught, that we have already uh, adjusted to, that can be applied to understanding diversity, equity, and inclusion. Because I think part of the challenge um, in you know getting more, uh, I think, support for diversity, equity, and inclusion is our people are thinking as though it's this outside new thing that they're going to have to learn, that they're going to have to put in all this work, like you talked about. You going through schooling, you weren't educated on this. So naturally, a lot of people who finish schooling and are, are somewhat 
you know, in depth in their career thinking, oh, man, I got to learn all of this now. So it seems daunting. It seems overwhelming. So if you could take this information and already adapt it to principles, to learning, to understandings that people already have as a foundation that they actually got through school system or they got through leadership programs, it makes it a lot pal- a lot more palatable for people so they could mm-hmm. absorb that information, connect with it better, and then apply it e- equally as great. Mm-hmm. I absolutely loved. I actually I felt inspired right away when you talked about look for knowledge that contradicts your own current knowledge. I thought, wow, I would not, we naturally as humans would not do that, but it is empowering when we do. I feel mm-hmm. like that's the way we help pave a path forward, as we mentioned at the beginning, is not just you know embracing the knowledge, but actually contradictory contradicting what you naturally seek out for knowledge as well as for groups that are your network i've learned that you know is how do you do that with with not the fear but the courage to you know expand your purpose through your knowledge and understanding and embracing Mm -hmm. it so um thank you for that because it's right away it's like okay what I'm going to look for now that will contradict what I think I know to be true, because then that way I'll be, I'll, it opens doors for seeking new knowledge that you would naturally not seek out. But that is truly a, truly an epic leadership development tool that mm-hmm. I feel that you've now shared with me and to everyone listening and watching here. So um, thank you for that. I guess you know, we move from the philosophy around, you know, how we um, face our fear and, and, you know, how we can confront it and go th- use those three aspects. Um, I guess the next question I could ask is what would be one way or some ways we can work towards cultivating our courage to confront our fear? You've mentioned a, a number of that. Is there anything else you want to share about how we could confront our fears? To therefore create change. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a it's a really good question because I think we always have to have that somewhat of a roadmap on what do we do next. And mm-hmm. you know, as you're saying, as you're saying that, Mo, the first thing I think about is um, cultural competence and growing that. And this is a very important aspect, and and it goes back to what you were just outlining um, of you know, seeking out information that's different than the world and the information that you've always been provided or you've always been around. Um, That's important to build your cultural competence because if you stay within the ethnocentricness of your own worldview, then you are only going to not only see things through your own worldview, but you're only going to respond to things from your own worldview, which means that there's going to be a lot of people who don't see the world the same way you do, don't have those same experiences that are going to be left out whether it's relational um, or emotional or social or whatever the case is. So I think it's so important to build your cultural competence. And, you know, here's the thing. I think going back to the fear, part of that fear of doing or saying the wrong thing comes back in some cases based on, you know, actual evidence of something that somebody said to someone else and it didn't go well. Um, And here's the thing I always tell people is that no matter what, your impact trumps your intention. 100% of the time. And this is where a lot of people get stuck. And this is where you get into a lot of that polarization in a lot of cases where you get, you know, people really fed up about DEIs because they're afraid to make mistakes because they've made a mistake. They've said something to somebody that was um, a microaggression, but they didn't, you know, understand. And then all of a sudden they're stepping back and they're just like, well, I'm not going to say anything anymore because, you know, you just get, attacked and I don't want to feel that way. And, you know, for me, for an example, I remember, um, you know, there is, it was, I was at my neighbor's house and it was a really awkward situation because he, he had his family there, his wife was there and everything. And then they had um, his parents there and they came over um, and (laughs) I was kind of like sitting in their backyard and they had this umbrella that was covering the seating area, a little bit of a canopy somewhat. 
and everyone was sitting under the umbrella. And, and sorry, I should have started with this: that the family is is Portuguese Italian, so they're they're white, um, and they were standing uh, sitting under the shade, and it was very sunny outside, and I had to sit on the side where there was no shade. And I remember um, the neighbor, my, the, my, my, my neighbor's wife says, Hey, do you want to come sit under the shade? And it was a a little bit of a cool day. And I'm like, no, no, it's totally fine. Um, You know, I, I, I don't mind getting a little bit of sun anyways, because it's, it's warming me up. And I remember um, his grandmother's mother says, "Uh, it's okay. His, His, his skin doesn't burn anyways. And it was funny because she said it so, like, just easily. It was just like a comment she just said. And I just sat there and I was just like, I looked around and and I don't even know, I can't even remember the responses, like the visual responses from my neighbors. But it was almost like, it, I, I could tell they, they didn't notice, but they could have noticed. It was very hard to read. Mm. And I had a decision to make at that time. Do I call them out or call them in or do I not say anything but I chose not to say anything at that time because I didn't want to disrupt the environment and I think that's part of I uh, the burden that um, diverse issues diverse people have when it comes to these circumstances is because sometimes we want to speak up but we can't and it's very difficult to but if I you know using that example with cultural competence that person, that grandmother should have realized that that statement was inappropriate. And the only way she would know that statement was inappropriate is if she has done some cultural research and and had some competence and understanding that that comment itself is, is, you know, a very discriminatory comment. Now, she didn't have the intention. I knew, I know for a fact, Mo, her intention was not to insult me. Her mm-hmm. intention was not to be a racist by any means, um, was not meant to discriminate me in any means, etc. She honestly said that with all the knowledge and all the experience she has had of her world up to that point. Mm-hmm. But she didn't realize that the impact was negative. And the only way to lessen that gap for you to feel more confident about the intention that you have, which is typically always good, versus the impact of how it lands on that other person, is building your cultural competence. That's the only way you can lessen that gap, to have more confidence that the intention of whatever you're saying or doing is going to have the impact that you desire. Mm. Wow. No matter what, your impact prompts intention and your example brings it full circle. Now, if grandmama had the knowledge and realized in the moment that what she said was absolutely inappropriate, what would have been the ideal situation for her to follow that up? What would you, because I've been there, done that, not that comment, but I, you know, put my feet in my mouth and um, I just recently had it. I mispronounced somebody's name, assuming something. And I'll share with what with you what I did after. But what would Grandma do to have um, fixed that situation, made it better, made her intention actually be good? Yeah, it, it, it's a great question because you're you're, and it's interesting that you're asking that question because that would actually entail her having the I know idea that what she said was inappropriate, and it's like the word just fat out of her mouth, the phrase, and she just realized that that moment, I don't think she would have realized. I don't think mm. she would have realized unless I called her out on it. Yeah. But um, I'll tell you this, I have a very, very, and remember, these were my neighbors. So mm-hmm. you don't want to have a bad relationship with your neighbor, right? Um, you don't want it to be awkward. And for mm. me to call out the mother at that point, um, it, it would have come off confrontational I think and not mm. to say I would have I would approach it with a derogatory term but I would have said to her um can you help me understand why you believe my skin wouldn't burn and what that does is open up this oh okay and then the response probably would be well I didn't mean any offense mm. now I'm now put in the position where if I continue to go down this lines of saying well it was offensive and I need mm. you to know that 
where I could look too insensitive. I could look like I'd blown it out of, of proportion. So that's the burden yeah. on the individual that has to deal with that impact where it's hard for them to address it because they're not, they're not comfortable or not confident that that person has the humility to say, wow, I had no idea. Um, I, I'm, I apologize. Mm-hmm. I will do better, you know? Um, but I don't think there would be a world or a situation where somebody would have said it and then realized it was a mistake unless the person led on to it. Right. Yeah. Read the room, realized what they said. And mm-hmm. um, I think, you know, with with uh, the power of that knowledge, you know, or that realization comes the responsibility to do better, whether it's mm-hmm. in that moment or to at least learn from that experience and be mindful when as you move forward in, you know, the next experiences that you'll have. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That's, yeah. That's where growth comes. That's where the courage to, to reflect mm-hmm. and to, um, you know, either understand that situation and learn from it or apologize. And, and, that, uh, and yeah. And think about like, think about how often that happens every single day oh, in, yes. you know, workplaces, with, you know, around North America, it happens often. And a lot of the times it doesn't go undressed. It doesn't go addressed. Mm-hmm. And that's the burden that the person has to deal with where every day they're facing these little microaggressions. Mm-hmm. Um, and I could give you a slew of them, which I won't, but these are the things that where if we're to cultivate real change and confront our fears, for me, I think my response is important. I, I come from a different place because I absorb myself in this world a lot. So for me, calling somebody in would be something that I would do um, more, I think, um, as a compassionate road to help this person grow. Mm -hmm. However, there's other people who are probably fed up, who are like, you know what, enough is enough. What you said was racist and you're despicable. And what that person does at that point is just, you know, they, they freeze up. And they're like, well, you know, I just made a mistake. It wasn't my intention. And now I'm being yelled at by this person. And then that just erodes the situation even more. So there are things that we have to be sensitive to, um, but it's incumbent on ourselves to do the learning, right? We shouldn't be putting other people in that situation. And that's why building your cultural competence, if you are working with people who are different than, than you, take it upon yourself. If you walk on a team and there's a team of different people, maybe it's uh, somebody with a disability, maybe it's somebody from the LGBTQ2 plus group, maybe it's somebody from uh, a different religion. Take it upon yourself to do your own homework, to understand the nuances, the nature, the experiences of those identities, because it will help you feel more comfortable when wanting to relate with them later on. Mm. Um, again, it's not their job to teach you if they're open to have a conversation because it's natural. Hey, you know, Mo, you know, um, I want to know what your experience is like being a woman in, you know, the the business world. Like, tell me how that journey was for you. Like, those are questions that you can ask based on where you are with that relationship with that individual. So, and they are willing to talk about their experience, you know, hey, if you're a new immigrant or newcomer, um, what was your experience like transitioning into the country? You know, what are some uh, successes you had? What were some challenges you had? You know, like these are caring conversations, compassionate, caring conversations that you could have with people um, that will prepare you to make sure that you're appropriately engaging with them in ways where it will start to make you feel more safe in the way you do it. So you're not kind of straddled by fear of saying the wrong thing because you've done the work on your own. And then you've also taken time to get to know them. Mm, love that. Book and it. Take the responsibility of your own of yourself to learn and get curious and also have those compassionate, caring conversations where you are curious and then listen for the sake, for the intention of learning and being interested. I love that because it's, again, very actionable and it's a very win-win. You take it upon yourself, but you also uh, are curious and reach out. And that's a fabulous way to, to build relationships. So Mm -hmm. well said. Well, while we talk about, you know, um, getting curious about what it, you know, what it is for a women's journey in the workforce, especially in professions, well, all professions where there is um, inequity around gender, um, 
leadership in the workplace, um, what would be some ways to celebrate women in the workplace that does, that you think are particularly effective in, in supporting inspired inclusion? Uh Yeah. You know, I, I I think um, one thing I would think of is celebrate the women that are in the organization currently um, and women that have been in the organization in the past. And I think it's important to highlight their achievements um, their bios, their stories, their experiences, because it goes a long way when you profile them and, you know, people from the front line uh, all the way to the C-suite can really see those journeys, can really start to identify, oh, these are the experiences that individual had and look at the successes that they had as well. So I think sometimes we don't have to look much further than within our own organization and approach those women who are still there and say, hey, we would like to profile you. Um, Mm -hmm. We would like to really put you on a platform to show everyone, you know, your achievements and to really highlight that. And I think giving them that platform, giving them that notoriety, I think is very valuable, especially for people coming up so they can see what it is and and how they can be. I think that's one way to do it. Another one too, you know, it's really important with women is to show the diversity. So really profiling women of color and in organizations that may not be as, let's say, abundant um, in terms of options. So you can reach out. And I think as you reach out in other organizations and other industries and really show off the, the success and the achievements of women of color, be it in the political field, be it in the, you know, business field, sports athletic, I think the reality is you want to be able to normalize it because the more people see women of color in their achievements and their success and the history and in current, it normalizes it in people's minds. Remember in the beginning of the podcast, when I talk about a lot of what we believe and a lot of our biases come from things that we see constantly bombarding us. Well, we have to take that same approach by showing women of color that have had a lot of success. So the next woman of color that is moving up the ladder in that organization, people will start to see that person as someone who can be as successful as everybody else has been in the organization and not have that bias in their mind by saying, well, we've never had somebody at that level. It's like it's it's normalized it in a lot of ways. So the power of representation, be it inside your organization or highlighting from other organizations, I think is so important. Um, and I would say probably another thing is support women, uh, especially uh, in the early stages of their career through mentorship programs and sponsorship. Like, I think that goes a long way when you're able to um, really connect with women in, in, in your corporation, both on a um, uh, formal and an informal way, right? And obviously formal is more of your mentorship programs, groups, webinars, things like that. Informal could be just those relationships you build organically and naturally, which tend to be the most successful in terms of mentorship and sponsorship. The only thing you have to mitigate there is making sure you're just not building relationships with people who look like you, but being intentional to say, you know, I want to uh, connect with, you know, young women of color in my organization. I know they're not representative in the higher levels. So I'm going to get to know them a little bit. And not only is it going to help me uh, learn more about who we have in our front line and what their capabilities are, but it's also going to help them as I show them the blueprint in a lot of ways of the path that I took, but more importantly, what I could do. And that's when you talk to mentorship, that's something men and women can do, um, you know, in t- inside their organization is provide uh, women in their careers that that professional mentorship. Mm, wow. So rich in, in advice there. And um, it, I, reflecting on that, I see where the work is, you know, where the opportunity for changing the way in which we mentor and lead and support and serve uh, for men and women, uh, based on the advice that you just gave, you gave three powerful, if not more, um, ways in which we could do that. So thank you. You obviously, well, you are too true to your accolades and being a phenomenal mentor and also um, coach. So speaking of that, 
I want to dive in and give you the opportunity to share what is um, your podcast, because you have what I believe to be a very compelling inside outside uh, perspective on leadership. Uh, you have a podcast called The Mind Leadership, and your co host is uh, the lovely Jennifer Bittner. And yeah. uh, the two of you are amazing together. And as a leadership development coach yourself, and with uh, Jennifer being a mental performance coach, you both impart valuable lessons on, and this is what I'm really interested in learning more from you about is on balancing workloads and personal mental thresholds. Mm -hmm. I'd love you to share more of how you guide individuals to achieve a sense of healthy accomplishment in this area. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it's wow. Uh, in, in 2020, um, during the pandemic, uh, Jenny and I started this podcast, The Mind Leadership. And it really dates back to when we first started working, working together back in, uh, I think it was like 2008. Um, you know, I hired her as a salesperson and I was her manager. And we were very two distinct different individuals. I was very management leadership type focused and she was more fun and, and, you know, just energy and whatnot. So it was this yin and yang and this partnership that worked really, really well. I always like, you know, like compare ourselves to that Phil Jackson, Michael Jordan type of relationship. She was just a phenomenal individual and she performed at a very, very high level. And throughout this performance that she had, she started to discover that, you know, the mental well-being and that balance in her life was being sacrificed because she was working so hard. She was an overachiever, but she was never listening to her body. And that kind of moved her into the direction of really focusing on that mental coaching perspective and really finding balance and finding fun in what you do. Where I really moved more as I grew in leadership towards uh, inclusive leadership and understanding that I always believe leadership is the principle of influencing people, while in inclusive leadership is about impacting the individual. And because of that granularity of leadership and inclusion, inclusive leadership, um, it really kind of helped us both because I think I will always be the type of person I am in terms of leadership. She will always be the type of person she is in the way she views leadership. And I think we were just growing those those different avenues, but we were able to come together in 2020 and say, let's bring both of our perspectives together and let's, you know, do something where we can provide other people that information, that growth and that knowledge. And we started it in 2020, I think it was like in April, and we started to get guests from all over the world. In our first season um, on our podcast, we focused leadership around many different avenues and aspects of leadership. So it was like health and wellness. It was like um, uh, food. It was like authors. It was corporate. It was entrepreneurs. It was like we had sex therapists on there. Like we just had everything because the concept of our season one was about leading your own life and leading your own life in many different avenues and starting with yourself because our, our motto is leadership starts in the mind. It starts with yourself. And then in season two, we've now kind of narrowed our focus to having guests on and talking more about um, your path to happy Mondays, because we wanted to keep our focus around the corporate entrepreneurship landscape of leadership. So a lot of the guests that we have now are either uh, like professional coaches, entrepreneurs, executives, executive trainers, etc. And they talk about in different areas, whether it's middle management, whether it's like keeping your focus in your vision, um, they're, they're just so great and really expanding um, our conversation, even the things that Jen and I know on, you know, leadership in general and how to create an environment where what's fun gets done, because I think that part is missing in a very fast paced world. Um, it's forever changing and so much serious stuff going out there. We want people to be able to come to work and have fun, to look forward to Mondays. And that's what this season two is about, is helping leaders cultivate the ability to make their people want to show up on Monday, enthusiastic, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, ready to go, because they're so excited for, you know, not only what you're going to do for them as a leader, but what their job enables them to do. So that's where we're at right now. And 
I love it. I love it. I, uh, you know, it's something that we're so passionate about. And yeah, the mind leadership has is, is just been great. Oh, I love it. I can't wait. I'm going to add it as my season. My, I'm going to go back and start at season one. Thank you for that. Because <laughs> I like to jump in. I don't read a book from the start to the finish. I kind of jump in where I feel like I need to jump in. But I'm going to go back to season one. So where can we find your podcast and uh, how can I help promote it? Because it's, oh, it's perfect. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, well, it's the Mind Leadership. We're on all podcast platforms. So uh, Amazon, um, iTunes, Apple, Apple, uh, Spotify. So just type us up, you'll find us. And we're also on Instagram under the Mind Leadership. So uh, yeah, that's where you can check us fantastic. out. Fantastic. Fantastic. And um, where can people find out more about you and how to work with you? Because I'm sure after listening to all of this, you are going to be sought after for either corporate work <laughs> or individual coaching. And uh, tell us, how can we, what are you up to? Yeah, you know what? I, I like to keep it simple. You can find me at Dwayne Smith on LinkedIn. Um, okay. So yeah, check me out there. And uh, yeah, looking forward to, to hearing from you. Excellent. Dwayne Smith on LinkedIn and go to his podcast on sounds like every platform, the yep. mind leadership. Love it. Well, as we wrap up, I just want to, um, first of all, thank you. I'm sure um, our listeners and viewers are going to absolutely take notes and uh, come back to this episode more than once. The nuggets of knowledge here are so, so invaluable, very rich. And um, I really think that, you know, women themselves, they're, they're inspired to be included. There's a sense of belonging and relevance and empowerment that we're all desiring. And I'm, I know with the environment that I work in, um, you know, allies to everything related to women's leadership is becoming stronger and it's moving in the right direction, but there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, we need to do it together. I loved uh, your your recommendations about mentorship and also collaborating with those you work with and the communities that you are in now and that you want to uh, enter into or be curious about. We really have to do this together. And mm -hmm. I have this quote I want to end with. And then Dwayne, I'm going to turn it over to you for the last thoughts. You're going to follow Gloria Steinman. No pressure. <laughs> oh, um, no pressure. <laughs> This quote I came up, I found, it's been in my journal for years, and I thought it was perfect for today. And uh, Gloria's quote is, don't think about making women fit the world. Think about making the world fit women. Hmm. Mm. Your, your thoughts or what? how would you like to take us to the finish here before I sign off and uh, conclude this? That's a That's a very good one. I actually have one, um, and <laughs> it's the first one that popped to my head. Uh, it's it's, and you may or may not know this one, Mo, unless you're into anime. But um, it's from a, a movie called The Afro Samurai, and in the movie, he constantly has this this saying that he says as he's moving through. Um, my aim only is to move forward. Um, so that has always sat with me. Um, you know, we always have to continue to move forward in our journey, no matter what that journey is. But moving forward means we're growing and we're learning and we're adapting and we're evolving. Um, and that's what we need to do, because no matter what, the world around us is going to be doing just that. So uh, don't get caught behind. Oh, you sing into my heart. That was brilliant. Gloria, look out. <laughs> oh, my aim is always to move forward. I love that, love that, love that. I'm going to leave it right there and just invite you all to check out my March blog. I will certainly link to this podcast episode. And I invite you to all share this episode with your friends. Let's really broaden our community and help everyone learn from this invaluable education. And also, don't forget to hashtag inspire inclusion. We're all responsible for a more inclusive and equitable future. And uh, that's right. Our aim here today was to always move forward. Thank you so much, Dwayne. From the bottom of my heart to yours, I appreciate you. And uh, thank you all for joining us. <laughs>